Takeoff. The full moon was shining. A light mist silvers over the peaceful English plains, brightening the colors. The Lincolnshire countryside is not known for its rich palette anyway. The town of Lincoln itself had already calmed down. The guys from the bombers knew it well. It was a town inhabited by lovely, friendly people who were so used to the pilots that they stopped noticing them. On a hill in the city is a tall cathedral, which serves as a great landmark for any airplane. The small villages scattered across the marshy plain slept peacefully. Here lived the simple, honest people that typify the east coast of England. The most industrious of the farmers has long since gone to bed. The lights in the village pub have dimmed and barely glowed. The bar, which a few hours ago had been full, had fallen silent. Everything here looked the same as it had a hundred years ago, except that the night itself was a little different, at least for 133 people. For 133 young airmen, myself included, our time had come. We weren't flying very high, at about 100 feet, and the intervals between planes were small too, so I suppose it looked very pretty from the ground. A large group of Lancasters in a neat formation, flown by guys who knew their business very well. Below us, almost under the belly of the airplane, at 200 miles per hour, were passing trees, fields, church spires, in short, England. We were embarking on a flight that we had been looking forward to for a long time, a flight that had been carefully planned, for which we had prepared long and hard. This raid, if successful, was to bring the most important results. We were to bomb the dikes. Those who have seen the cockpit of a Lancaster in the moonlight as the plane flies over the very ground will understand me. It's very difficult to describe. The pilot sits slightly to the left in a high-up padded chair with armrests. Normally he holds the steering wheel with his left hand, his right hand working various knobs and buttons. But when over enemy territory, most pilots take the helm with both hands. It takes a strong man to fly the Lancaster. In front of the pilot, the instrument scales gleam. On the blind flight panel, as the pilots call it, red lights flash, indicating the mechanisms to be monitored. The pilot must know exactly the duties of the rest of the crew in order to give an order to just the right person. The flight engineer is the pilot's best friend and sits next to him, keeping an eye on the engine control panel. Most flight engineers in Bomber Command are ordinary ground service mechanics who have volunteered to fly, and they do a fine job. The cockpit is warm, which is why the pilot and flight engineer are dressed very lightly. Their oxygen masks dangle from straps at their chins. These masks are considered a necessary evil by everyone. Over enemy territory, we wear them all the time, not because we need oxygen, but because the pilot doesn't have time to take his hand off the wheel and put the microphone to his mouth. As a result, after sitting in a mask for six hours, you're exhausted to the max. Many times we ask the question, why don't we have laryngophones like Americans? And we never got an answer. Between the two forward portholes is the most important instrument, the compass repeater, which is linked to the main compass at the rear. The pilot's eyes constantly run from the repeater to the speedometer, from the speedometer to the air horizon, from the air horizon to the moon, from the moon to the earth, and back to the repeater. No wonder my eyes are as red as a rabbit's after returning. This is what the whole thing looks like. The glass hood. Soft moonlight. Two young men. They are very young, but they are already seasoned professionals. They are proud of their squadron, determined to complete the mission and return home. All are silent. Only the wind is whistling overboard, and the four Merlin engines are humming heavily. It's quite warm in my Lancaster, although Hutch has turned off the heat. I'm sitting in just my shirt and life jacket. Oddly enough, my vest is made in Germany. I took it from one of the planes I shot down in 1940, and it serves as the envy of the entire squadron. The windows are open and a jet of cold air blasts into the cockpit, making an eerie noise. I, straining my voice, shouted to flight engineer Palford, For God's sake, close that window. Palford was born in London, 
He is polite and exceptionally hardworking. He will rummage around until he finishes the job, and there is no way to distract him. Finally something clicks, the noise stops, and there is relative silence. I asked Terry, Where are we now? I believe we've been blown a mile to the left. I'll check it out now. What do you think? Spam. Spam is our score. He takes quite a while to disentangle himself from his tether straps before answering, then finds our position on the map. It's rewound on two rollers and looks something like a roll of toilet paper. But no matter what it looks like, its roll is exceptional. It is the map that Spam and Terry must use to lead us to our goal. Yeah, you're right, Terry. We've been blown about a mile to the left. We're over the railroad at Camelin. Span was born in Australia and was undoubtedly his country's top scorer. He's not too confident reading the map, however, and Terry looks over his shoulder now and then to check. Then he ducks into his cubicle to do some quick maths. After that, I'm ordered to change course three degrees to the right. A slight movement of the handle causes the lumbering Lancaster to almost imperceptibly turn its blunt nose slightly to the south. The guys flying next to me repeat this maneuver. Terry's voice is heard again. Ten minutes to shore. We'll be able to make up our minds for sure as we fly right over Yarmouth. They're great guys, Terry and Spam. Senior Lieutenant Terram was born in Calgary, Canada, and retains a soft Canadian accent. He received an excellent education and loves his pretty wife, Pat, an Irish woman who serves in the Royal Air Force Women's Auxiliary. Terry is probably the best navigator in the squadron. He has already flown 35 combat sorties and knows his job very well. I have never once seen Terry lose his temper, although he sometimes gets into a long argument with Spam about the coordinates of the plane at a given moment. Spam, or rather Senior Lieutenant Spafford, was born in Melbourne, Australia. He is a great comrade, and we have been in a huge number of parties together. As a bombardier, he is the squadron record holder. Not long ago he asked me, why on earth do we take parachutes? After all, we fly at such a low altitude that we simply wouldn't have time to jump out even if we had to. It was a perfect illustration of what he thought about flying. It was roulette for him, and Spam always bet on the right number. He has been flying a little longer than Terry, and has flown about 40 sorties now. He used to fly with one of the best pilots in 50 Squadron. When he joined my squadron I thought my flying style would make him nervous, but he calmed down after the first couple of flights. Spam, too, retained the characteristic accent of his homeland. I thought I had a typical Southern English accent with its extended pronunciation. As a result, we banter with each other now and then, but always without rancor. We know full well that anything can happen, but we remain a great team. In the back sits Trev, a tail gunner, to use the official term of the Royal VSS. I believe he's got the most uncomfortable seat in our bomber. He's in one tunic for now, but he'll be putting on his old fur overalls a little later. Not because it will get cold, but because of its scent. All clothing that has done a fair amount of flying takes on a specific odor, pungent but by no means unpleasant. This odor simply screams that the owner of the suit is a very experienced pilot. A wife or loving mother would immediately send this thing to the laundry, if only it fell into her hands. But the guys themselves look at it quite differently. As far as I could see, the more stinky the jumpsuit, the more they love it. My tail gunner, Captain Algernon Trevor Ruber, recipient of the Distinguished Flying Cross, was born into a noble family. He is 28 years of age, and everything fits the pedigree. Eton, Oxford, 65 sorties. He's one of the leaders of our squadron. He might go to the pub with the lads in the evening, drink himself unconscious, but he'll be fine in the morning. He got his medal for shooting down two fighters that tried to shoot him down. His wife lives in Skegness and is due to give birth in the next few days. I guess that's all Trev has on his mind. Anyway, so far he hasn't uttered a word. Maybe he's had the same thoughts as me. We're seeing England for the last time. Up front in the radio seat is Hutch. He's flown 40 missions with me 
and never once has his hand wavered. He is one of those great little Englishmen who have an iron character. During most of his flights, he suffers from air sickness, but when he picks up the radio key, the sickness goes away in a flash. He's in love with a pretty girl from Boston. In the nose turret sits Jim Deering from Toronto, Canada. This is his first combat flight. He's still a perfect youngster, but since my best gunner suddenly fell ill, there was no time to look for a replacement, so I took the first one I could find. I'm nestled in my comfortable chair, but I can't banish my anxious thoughts. What awaits the seven of us in Germany? All of us have wives and sweethearts behind us, sleeping in the houses we are now flying over. England looks peaceful and serene, but we are soldiers. And now there is a war going on, the bloodiest and most brutal in history. We are on a bombing offensive. I've led a carefree life for a long time, and I've gotten used to it. But now, when I think of my comrades who have not returned from their flight, I shudder. Only a line on the memorial plaque in the building of the Ministry of Aviation and a commemorative letter in the squadron headquarters are left of them. I involuntarily squirm in my cozy chair and try to relax. I need to push away the gloomy thoughts and concentrate on controlling the airplane. Suddenly a silver mirror appears ahead, the North Sea. It looks very unfriendly, so we still have the whole ordeal ahead of us. I hope that in a few hours it will seem a little different. And then Terry appears again. Yes, we've got Yarmouth in front of us. All right. That's the one. I can see the harbor. Are you sure it's Yarmouth? Right. Okay. Turn to course, P.O. Roger that. P.O. Okay. And now our airplane has turned its nose straight toward the point at which we will cross the Dutch coast. The sea is as smooth as a mirror, literally not a single wrinkle. We immediately go lower and lower until we are only 50 feet out of the water. This will help avoid radar detection. I try to put the G-George on autopilot, but it proves to be malfunctioning. The airplane takes a sharp nose dive, and I barely have time to take control again. One of the planes flying to the left flashes a red warning light, asking, What the hell are you doing? I level the car and am relieved to try to light a cigarette. But while I do, we almost dive into the water for the second time. My guys might think I'm just crazy. Eventually, I ask Palford to light my cigarette for me. The night is so bright that I can clearly see the guys flying to my right and left. Flying on the right is John Hopgood on M. Moway, a great Englishman whom we call Hoppy, the world's most trusted friend. He loves his mother and loves to fly. Hoppy often flew with me and drank just as often. He always found flying over Germany an interesting job. Hoppy has absolutely no nerves and loves flying. He looks upon flying as a rare profession in which one can only achieve perfection by long training. Hoppy was one of those guys who absolutely refused to take a vacation and flew over 50 sorties in my squadron. He knows how to hold a line, that Hoppy. His huge Lancaster flies right next to me, just a few feet away. He keeps his course without changing the interval one iota. One day in preparation for this raid we had to land at Manston in Kent. The tips of our wings were literally touching the airplanes lined up on the field. Such an art delighted the fighter daredevils, and they admitted that they had never seen anything like it. I should remark that Hoppy was probably the best pilot in the squadron. On the other side flashed the Aldous signal light some message from Mickey Martin. It was as if ships in a naval convoy were conversing. Mickey comes from Australia and has a lot of flying experience, too. He's rougher than Hoppy. For Martin, flying is not interesting unless it involves danger. In the past, during raids on Berlin and Hamburg, instead of returning with the other guys at the safe altitude of 22,000 feet, he would descend to the ground and shave across Belgium, Holland and France, shelling everything he could on the way. It's a kind of entertainment for him that he and his crew enjoy. However, today he will have to forget his liberty and act strictly according to the plan, because any deviation from it will disrupt the mission. And now he's flying alongside us. But I notice that he stays even lower than me, and therefore I begin to be a little afraid, as if he had not taken a drink of water. 
but Martin seems to be quite confident, because he never goes below thirty feet. At the back is everyone else, the American Melvin Young, who leads Bill Estelle and David Maltby. He is followed by Henry Model along with Australians Dave Shannon and Len Knight. That's my link, and we make a great team together. The sea is surprisingly calm. I haven't seen anything like it before. As Mickey goes lower to the water, I can clearly see the reflection of his airplane. And to the north comes the nightmare of all bombers. A ghostly glow. Scientists call it the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis, but they should hear what we call it when enemy fighters are around. This glow is a constant presence all summer long. Summer is summer. The time of darkness is very short. We have to get over the target as quickly as possible and make it back. But 200 miles away, in deep, deep bunkers, the Germans are awake. The cathode tubes of the sophisticated equipment, which should detect us and raise the whole air defense system on its feet, are flickering green. The lower we fly, the closer we can get before they detect us. But I know that at a distance of 30 miles, we will still be spotted, even if the planes will be flaps of bomb hatches to hit the crests of the waves. And then the anti-aircraft gunners will rush to their guns. And then the fighters take to the air. And then turmoil rises in the Air Defense Control Center. And then the Kratz and Quislingatsi will rush to dugouts and shelters, with fear listening to the hum of the engines of our Lancaster. Hutch read the message. What is it, Hutch? He says he's gonna be drunk as hell tomorrow night. Tell him, you're quite right. It's going to be the biggest binge of all time. Hutch tapped the handle of the signal lamp. Soon we were flying over a small convoy, whose ships flashed searchlights requesting identification from us. We immediately fired the proper signal flare before they could open fire. The sailors, courteous as usual, transmitted by searchlight. Good hunting. Hutch, who handled the searchlight as skillfully as he handled the radio key, and who didn't drink at all, flashed back, We're going to get drunk as hell tomorrow night. I suspect he stumped the ship's commander with this. He was left to wonder whether his signalman had made a mistake in taking the message, or whether these pilots had lost their minds. England was far behind. Terry, calm as ever, with the help of a special device measured the speed of our plane relative to the surface. He suddenly said, There's no wind today. Skip, we're not getting blown away at all. But to check it all the same, I'll drop a signal cartridge on the water. Then he shouted to Trev, who was sitting behind him. Trev, are we drifting or not? A little later Trev's reply was heard. Absolutely no drift. The signal round is ten miles exactly behind us. It's right on the scope of my turret. This made Terry very happy and he was able to start calculating. Later he reappeared nearby and reported. Our speed relative to the ground is 203.5 miles per hour. We will be over the target in exactly 1 hour 10 minutes 30 seconds. We should cross the shoreline maintaining the same course, so everything is fine. I should note that you have deviated from the true course by one degree. Navigators are funny guys. For some reason, they think a pilot can maintain course to within a degree. I'm mentally smiling. The navigators form a secret society, a kind of navigators union. They take whole squadrons under their command, not to mention individual airplanes. But I believe they fully deserve it. The navigators have a very hard job, and after four years of war, they have a firm grasp of what should be done and how it should be done. Our bomber command probably has the best navigators in the world, and our night flights are exceptionally accurate. Although maybe the navigators try so hard because the quality of their work determines whether they get home. We have one more hour of flight left, one hour to Germany, one hour to meet the anti-aircraft guns. I say to myself, there are 133 guys here with you. Some of them may only have an hour to live, an hour before all hell breaks loose around them. Some of them won't come back. But that's not going to happen to me. I've never allowed the thought that I might not come back. We won't all come back, but which of these 133 will be the unlucky ones? 
What are they thinking right now? Maybe all they're thinking about is their mission, how to keep the plane on course. What's the tail gunner of Melvin Young's plane thinking about? Because he's not coming back. What's the bombardier of Henry Model's plane thinking? Because he's not coming back either. What is the tail gunner of Hoppy's plane thinking? What does he want to do with his life? He's going to parachute out from a height of only 80 feet, miraculously survive, and spend the rest of the war in a Piotto camp. He and the bombardier of the same plane will be the only ones captured during this raid. The rest will die. Those who don't make it home. We have one more hour left, one hour of thinking about all of this, one hour of flying in a straight line, and then mad maneuvers to evade anti-aircraft fire. I think of all that and much, much more. I think of my wife, who thinks I went on a training flight as an instructor. I think of my dog who died last night, about the scientists who made this raid possible. I wonder, what am I even doing here? Why? Why am I so lucky? I've been pondering this since the early days of the war, because the rigors of wartime have quickly turned a company of merry hangers on serving in the Royal Air Force into a stern brotherhood in arms whose members have been staring death in the face for many days in a row for four endless years now. The day of August 31, 1939, was quite hot. I sat on the bank of a small sailboat, dressed in bathing shorts, and tried to get a tan, although the sun was already rather autumnal. At the same time I tried to splash the broken line, which was not easy, although I had been a scout a few years before. The sun was scorching. The sea was deep blue. In the stern of the boat, padded, sat Anne, lovely as ever. She was dozing. Windy, my hydro-aviation cat who had spent more time in the air than any other cat, purred in her lap. I glanced at her occasionally, thinking about my own thoughts. It was a couple hundred yards to the shore. I could hear the rustle of the surf, but it was not a big wave today, so the boat swayed only slightly. This suited Anne, who, despite her charm, was seasick. From Monkston Beach came the voices of children. They were building sandcastles, playing leapfrog, and generally turning the beach into a playground. I remember one group of kids hastily building a sand dike to shelter their dainty castle from the waves. However, the tide began to come in, and one by one the waves began to hit the causeway, eating away at it. But then one higher wave broke through the breach and the water rushed in. There was a vulnerable point in the defense system, and the children's shovels threw more and more sand at a feverish pace, trying to patch the hole. But it was all in vain. In the end, an even higher wave simply swept the entire dam away amid screams and shrieks. Colorful sandals floated on the water, and then the kids rushed off to lunch. At that moment I couldn't even imagine that this little spectacle could turn out to be a prophecy. Although war seemed still very far away, I was aware of the latest developments and was well aware that the outlook looked very bleak. Germany had issued an ultimatum to Poland. It had been rejected. Germany said, well, then. And on top of that, a Russo-German treaty was signed. I never thought that Poland would fight for the Danzig Corridor. She had cavalry, and Germany had tanks. Poland had a few ancient airplanes, and Goring had long ago spread the word about the terrifying power of his favorite child, the Luftwaffe. And if Germany decided to invade Poland, we'd be too late to intervene. So what to do? We were totally unprepared. A week ago, we took part in the summer exercises of the Metropolitan Air Defense System. Twice we raided London from the Dutch coast. Not once did we encounter enemy fighters and managed to fly another 150 miles to flatten the Royal Air Force headquarters at Abingdon. When we landed we were proud of our exploits and discussed them at length, but then the Army reported that we had been shot down by anti-aircraft guns as we crossed the coastline. This amused us, as it showed that our anti-aircraft gunners were prone to wishful thinking. Although we were indeed fired upon by anti-aircraft guns near Hook Van Holland, the commander of our formation did not maneuver too well, and as a result, 
one squadron invaded the airspace of a neutral power, so I had a baptism of fire, although it didn't make much of an impression on me, just a few black blobs in the sky. But we couldn't ignore those bursts completely. Our allies were firing at us. Their gunners had gotten the altitude right, though they weren't aiming too well. But as bad as the situation looks today, a year ago it was much worse. We didn't even have the Hampton bombers, we were flying prehistoric Hawker Hines. Yeah, this crisis wasn't as bad as the last ones. In Lincolnshire we had a running joke. The bomber boys are doing their best to prepare for war, while Chamberlain and Hitler are making peace in the world. We loaded machine guns, refueled tanks, and even repainted the planes in camouflage. The only annoying detail was the lack of bombs on the airfield. They didn't arrive until three weeks later. But anyway, there was no point in thinking about it all. It was just frustration. And anyway, I was on vacation. So I dozed off to the quiet splash of the waves against the side of the boat, worrying only about not burning my back. War did not exist for me. Suddenly the boat rocked, and someone's voice snapped me out of my hat slumber. Guy, there's a telegram for you on the beach. It was the son of the local doctor, himself an ardent yachting enthusiast. What's the matter? A month or two ago, I finished navigational training. Perhaps the adjutant would like to report the results. Is everything all right, or did I fail? I shouted to him. Thanks, John. You woke me up. But John had already sailed on, trying not to lose a moment of rest on this beautiful day. Only the little boy remained on the beach, a light in the window for his loving parents, whom I knew little of. For better or worse, but this little boy knew how to swim a little. He decided to show his little girlfriend that he was much better than Bill, his ten-year-old rival. To do this, he took a telegram in his mouth, jumped into the warm water, and swam to the boat. I began to watch him with some interest. Anne was awake too. The boy was swimming badly, some indescribable mixture of breaststroke and fathom. He was making a lot of splash, and my telegram got wet very quickly. When he swam closer, I realized that I would not read anything happy in the telegram. Finally, the boy grabbed the side of the boat, but before I could grab his hand and pull him up, he turned and made the difficult journey back to the beach. I picked up the telegram. The ink was a little blurred, but still I managed to read that it was addressed to the local post office. This was because at the time of departure, I did not yet know where I would be staying. We took a room at Mrs. Thompson's for a moderate sum, four shillings and sixpence a day, which suited my salary as a senior air lieutenant. The telegram was marked, urgent. The daughter of the village postmaster, who knew me a little, got on her bicycle and brought the telegram to the beach. Anne's voice broke the lingering silence. Wouldn't it be better to open it? Still thinking about the exams, I read the telegram loudly. It was short and unambiguous. Return to the unit immediately. Two hours later, I was already packing. I put Wendy in Mrs. Thompson's care, promising to pick her up later. But I realized that the cat would never see me again. Then it was time for goodbyes. Goodbyes to the Crawfords, at whose house I had vacationed last summer. A few tears were shed, and I even felt like a character in a war movie returning to the front. Goodbyes to Anne. Goodbyes to Ruth Wilson Bowen, with whom I had recently quarreled and had just reconciled. We were supposed to meet the day before yesterday, but she went off with some guy. There was also Desmond, who had just enlisted in the army. There were a lot of other people whose names I just can't remember. Then we rode off with Freddie Bilby, saddling up in his old Elvis. My good friend Freddie had just arrived from Oxford, where he was studying biology. He was only 23 years old, a good-looking guy with a lush head of hair. His Elvis was in 1928. As we rolled through the village, old fishermen waved at us. But we were well aware that the horse car klaxon was the last time we would hear it on these streets. As we raced down the road, rather riskily overtaking everything that was pulling in the same direction, we kept quiet. At Carmarthen, we stopped for lunch. The Boar's Head Tavern, a nice little tavern, had a couple of decent steaks, 
and a decent beer to wash them down. We then hit the road again on the Herefordham Valley past Brecon. We then got out on the highway to Stratford-on-Avon. Several times we lost our way. There were the first signs of impending war as long lines lined up outside the gas stations. It seems to me that everyone had decided that gasoline would be issued on cards from the first day of the war. Often there were cars full of bales and suitcases on the road. People were trying to get home as quickly as possible. Most of them, however, were soon to start sending their children back to the villages. I could not make sense of my feelings. On the one hand, I felt a certain excitement, but at the same time I felt a strange desolation, because this was the first time this was really happening. The silence was broken by Freddy. You know, Guy, I have a strange feeling. None of us know what's going to happen to us in the next few days, do we? Just yesterday we were getting ready for a fun cocktail party. Now what are we preparing for? I have absolutely no idea. Neither do I. If war breaks out, and I fear it's heading that way, my squadron will have to support our boys in France, and I have a great fear that we won't live long enough to get to know her better. I was convinced of that, but still I found the strength to make a joke. But you'll probably get a chance to put your medical experience into practice. That's for sure. I graduated from Oxford and got my medical degree. I think I'll be posted to Kent, to a field hospital, from where we'll be transferred to France when things get tight there. I have a feeling it's going to be a bloody business. I smiled a little. Freddy, the doctor, was an idealist. He intended to save lives and I, the realist, intended to take them. Our roads to war went in different directions, though both were absolutely necessary. As we rolled down the highway, I admired the peaceful countryside and wondered what would happen to me a year later. How I hated the Nessus. How could normal people in Germany let this gang of thugs who wanted world domination get their hands on power? Their slogan was brutality, atrocity, barbarism. The Rhineland, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Abyssinia, and Albania were only the beginning of a long list. I thought of the children building their sand dams and beautiful sandcastles on the beach. Their weak walls were no defense against the high waves crashing in from all sides. They had to be built in time, before the tide began, mixing sand and stones with cement, calling for help from other children lazing in the sun. Then the tide could not overwhelm the castle. Only if nations unite when common freedom is threatened, despite different ideals, different languages, will they be able to create a common army that will be so strong that an aggressor will not be able to break that barrier. America has already declared that this is a European war. It doesn't concern us. Russia has signed a pact with Germany. The other friendly powers maintained a strict neutrality. It looked like England and France were going to have to pick up the slack. I was not a career military man. I had joined the Royal Air Force in 1936 just to learn to fly. In April I was going to leave military service to become a test pilot. It was a good job that didn't pay badly. But Mussolini broke all my plans when he invaded Albania. And now Hitler had crumpled my entire summer vacation, and it looked like it would be for years to come. England wasn't ready for war, no one doubted that. Although the Royal Navy was babbling something about an impenetrable blockade that would bring Germany to her knees in six months, although the British Lion had acquired wings, was it all serious? We had very few bombers, mostly Wellingtons and Hamptons. Good old Wheatleys still survived. But none of them could carry enough bombs, and only a few crews knew how to find targets. The navigational work was put out of hand badly. Most of the fighter aircraft were gladiators and hurricanes eye. Squadrons of Spitfires, Typhoons and Lancasters were still only in the dreams of designers. We had very few flight schools, and even those were within range of German bombers. The Imperial pilot training program had not yet been set in motion. What could happen as a result of these delays? Wouldn't we have to fight with ever-melting forces until we had nothing left at all? The last of the pilots with military experience, who were still in the Royal Air Force, said that the average life expectancy of a bomber pilot was 10 hours flying time. In that case, we had no future. 
What would happen in the cities and factories that Germany would start bombing from the first day of the war? We had no serious air defense. This summer, a brigadier general invited me to a drill of army anti-aircraft gunners who were trying to shoot down target drones. I agreed and for two hours I watched the army anti-aircraft gunners fire hundreds of rounds at a small biplane that was whizzing back and forth over their heads at 5,000 feet. They fired just nastily. And the target wasn't even scratched. It was only when it went in for a landing that the control officer failed to handle it and the target crashed with its wing into the sea. Then one of the army officers, not hiding his pride, said, and yet in the end we finished her off. He did not even blush as he looked into the face of the Air Force officer who had to repair the target to continue the exercise the next day. The state of the army was simply terrible. Almost no tanks, no modern weapons, no trained personnel, although it was not the army's fault. Just look at our compatriots. They resented us loudly when we flew over London, trying to learn how to intercept night bombers. They called us cheeky playboys. Sluggish apathy and fed-up complacency may well have brought the British Empire to its knees, if not blown it to pieces altogether. In 1936, the Air Force began to increase, but the process was agonizingly slow and even today we were not much stronger than in 1938. Munich, what a sight. But maybe Chamberlain was right after all, who knows. The only thing I'm sure of is that thank God we didn't go to war in 1938. And what can be said about our ally France? In July, we flew to Marseilles and back via Paris and Lyon to show the flag. We visited several airfields along the way but did not see a single French airplane anywhere. Where had they all gone? No one knew. It seems that the French government had no less hand in the collapse of their country's defense capability than ours. Why did two great nations fall so low? Perhaps the roots of this should have been looked for in the past. The color of both nations fell on the battlefields of World War I or became disillusioned with attempts to get our nations to work together. The result was those who remained. If, even by chance, we had any hope of winning the war, even though it seemed very distant. So, to protect our children, we should have allowed young men who were capable of fighting to participate in government. I had read many books about the last war and knew that it had resulted in many deaths, caused chaos, destruction, horrific suffering, followed by new, previously unseen disasters, stifling inflation, rampant crime, industrial decline. I hope that none of this would be repeated in a new war, and if it did break out, the perpetrators of these crimes would be severely punished. My musings were cut short when we passed Woodstock Road, where my school, Street Edwards, was located and arrived in Oxford. Freddie dropped the old lady, Elvis, in front of a pub where we decided to pop in for a moment. After a couple of beers we were approached by some guys we knew. They all happened to be on the same boat. Some were off to Oxford University Squadron, others were due to join the army, some were waiting to be drafted into the navy. We only parted after a dozen beers, feeling much better, and went out for lunch. It was quite late, and we were quite hungry, so we finished the royal meal with a burgundy of the 1928 vintage. After another round of drinks, I literally piled into the train car. Goodbye, Freddy, good luck. Goodbye, guy. God knows when I'll see you again. All the best. And the train moved north. What a journey. It was the first time I'd ever experienced a blackout. The cars were packed to the brim with soldiers and civilians, all eager to get somewhere. After many stops with shouts and yells and the clinking of flasks, we arrived in Lincoln at 4 o'clock a.m. I was suffering terribly from a hangover. After some nervousness, after signing a couple of papers, I motored to Scampton, sunny Scampton, as we called it, for it was in Lincolnshire and not many people got sunshine there. But there was an old bomber airbase left in the town from the last war. As we drove through the gates, I noted that all the windows were covered with black curtains and the street lights were out. In the officer's mess hall, only the dim blue lamps of the emergency lighting were burning. It was impossible to read in their dim light, 
but there were not enough blackout curtains for all the buildings. When I finished breakfast and was about to go to bed, our eagles arrived. Usually at 6 o'clock a.m., there isn't a soul in the officers' mess halls of the FAC, but now things were different. They had been up since the crack of dawn. They hadn't changed and greeted me still cheerfully. Hello, Gibbo. Nice vacation, old boy. Hello, so and so. Back to fight, are you? But a little later, there was silence in the dining room when we heard that Germany had invaded Poland. And I went to sleep. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The next two days flashed by rapidly, with both enemies showing increased activity. All bomber command bases were in complete disarray. On the perimeter of the airfield's caterpillar tractors, some of them dragging long tails of bomb carts. Others spread our Hampton on gravel roads to parking areas. Squadrons dispersed to avoid losses from enemy bombs. Around the airfield's ground maintenance units hastily dug trenches for anti-aircraft guns and covered them with sandbags. The only trouble was that the guns themselves were not in these trenches yet. The chemical officers were running around like crazy, setting up their detectors everywhere. These detectors were of two models, and they always made me laugh. One, the yellow one, was supposed to turn red when there were poisonous gases in the atmosphere, but for some reason it failed too often. The other looked like a piece of cheese hanging from a hook. What it was, I was never able to figure out. Only this cheese disappeared very quickly. Maybe illiterate birds stole it. At all bases, available transport was dispersed in the neighborhood, so the group commander could well find a gasoline truck in the flower beds of his garden. The personnel were forbidden to leave the location of the unit. The employees of the operational departments were buried deep underground in the headquarters bunkers. It was almost impossible to enter or leave. In front of the door, a steel plate half an inch thick, sat two sentries with rifles. This was where all IDs were carefully checked, and these guys were finally getting a chance to get even for all their past troubles with Cerberi like the squadron surgeons. Inside the bunkers, in the ghostly glow of the blue lamps again, the clerks and women of the auxiliary of the KVVS. They were carrying rolls of maps, cutting them, gluing them, folding them, twisting them. There were maps of Holland, France, the Siegfried Line. There were even maps of Berlin. There were two officers sitting in the corner, going over the maps with their targets indicated. As I passed by, I noticed that there were pictures of Wilhelm Shaven Harbor pinned to each one. In the middle of the room, the base commander sat at a huge desk, soaked and flustered. There was a reason for this. Directly in front of him was a mountain of folders labeled Military Plans, Phase 1, Phase 2, and so on. The folders contained documents that would only come into effect in the event of war or mobilization. He frowned and grimaced now, and then. The young officer stood on the stairs near a huge map pinned to the wall and at times whispered something to the female assistants. If they giggled, the base commander turned black as a cloud. The hangars rang and rumbled, as hammers were being used to straighten the airplane plating and hammer in some rivets. Sometimes one of the mechanics, having forgotten, began to hum something, and then the senior surgeon, or Chiffy, immediately rushed to the voice, and the singing was silenced. If we try to characterize the situation as a whole, we can say simply, vanity of vanities. But the flying staff was not affected. Most of the day we sat or lay on the grass in front of the canteen building. The sun was scorching mercilessly, and some of us even took off our flight overalls and threw them next to us. Officially, we were in a state of pre-flight readiness. What that meant, we didn't understand, but we assumed that we would be sent to bomb something somewhere sometime. There was the usual idle chatter, about girls, about drinking, but not a word about the war. We had all heard that our ambassador in Berlin had given Hitler an ultimatum, demanding the withdrawal of German troops from Poland. There was still a tiny hope that things would settle down. I even told my crew that we had been called back from leave too soon, and the matter would end in unprecedented disgrace, 
because Hitler would not start bombing Britain until after the Nuremberg rally on September 13. Since no one was allowed to leave the base, wild drinking parties were organized in the evenings. As usual on such occasions, it was either our squadron or our eternal rivals, 49 Squadron, that stood out. After that, all the guys had a terrible hangover. About this period I have only fragmentary memories. The commander razzes someone for the lack of a parachute. Anxious faces of people crowded around the loudspeaker to listen to the latest news. Hurried chewing of lunch. A trip back to the hangar on a crowded truck. The tiresome gramophone records and the terrible heat. Huge headlines in the evening editions of the newspapers, including the famous, No War This Year. My old messenger Crosby, who woke me up every day at 4 a.m., said in his characteristic bass, Your cup of tea, sir. More bad news today, sir. Would you like a bath, sir? The whole world went mad. We all had a strange feeling that tomorrow we might leave this world. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. On September 3, the A squadron pilots were sitting in the commander's office. We had just finished drinking the morning tea that the girl from the auxiliary units had brought us, and there was smoke floating in layers in the room. Squadron Commander Oscar Bridgman sat with his cap pushed to the back of his head and his feet on the desk. His chair swayed, threatening to collapse backwards every second. Our Oscar had a terrible temper. He had a temper, but he could fly as well as anyone. I couldn't have wished for a better wing commander. Behind him, we felt like behind a stone wall. That's where the rest of us sat. Our tall swimming champion, Jack Kinnich, who had no sense of humor. There were also Mulligan and Ross, whom we nicknamed Mull and Rossi, two Australians who had joined the squadron in 1937. They went almost everywhere together. At times, they would get into long arguments, which the whole squadron would laugh at. There was also an Englishman, Ian Hayden, married to a pretty girl called Dell. Ian was very attached to Dell, and every evening, as soon as he was free, he ran away to Lincoln, where they lived. Now he was in a great deal of pain, for he had not been home for several nights. Here sat Strong. What an eagle! He had a talent for always getting into some kind of story. Pitcairn Hill was the only career officer in our unit. Very good-looking, a true Scotsman, Pete was a fine sportsman and played rugby for the Air Force. Then there were all the others who I won't list. However, in any case, they too served in the A-Link. We were proud of ourselves, the A-Link guys, because we were always ahead of the B-Link, both in flying and drinking. Suddenly, the door opened and Chiffy walked in. All the planes are ready for a test flight. Okay, Oscar said and slapped his palm on the table. Staff sheet. Langford trumpeted and stepped out. He was a great guy, this Langford. He was in charge of the technical condition of the squadron's airplanes. For several years now he had shown up with the unfailing report that the planes were ready, and I have no doubt that he was doing the same today. I could write a great deal about our ground staff. They were wonderful people who gave their best to their work, but received very little for it. The only thing that kept them going was their pride in their work. As Oscar finished telling the bishop's joke, the door suddenly burst open and Crappy flew in. Crappy Kitson looked as if he were going into labor. There was something unusual about it. He didn't say anything but ran over to the window and turned on the radio. In complete silence we heard the words of Chamberlain, who told us, and the whole world the sad news. There was henceforth a state of war between Great Britain and Germany. Oscar took a deep drag and then let the smoke out of his nostrils. All right, boys, so be it. You'd better head to your planes and check them out. Be back in half an hour. There's probably jobs for us. I went to inspect my S. Charlie and found it in the regular parking lot. It was my airplane, and I must say, a pretty lousy one. On takeoff, it was always skidding to the right and in flight the left wing was always pulling down. Sometimes, the engine would fail, but we put up with it. We even loved it because it was ours. During this period my crew was not fully staffed. The co-pilot with me was a Somerset native named Jack Warner. The radio operator was Shorty McCormick. 
It didn't take too long to check all the systems. The mechanics had done a good job, and the airplane was perfectly serviceable. Then we went to the mess hall, where we had a quick snack to a wheezing gramophone. Our lunch was interrupted by a loudspeaker. All crews to assemble immediately in the pre-flight briefing room. We expected to immediately receive orders to fly to bomb Germany, or that German planes had already flown out to us. But instead we were addressed by the base commander, Air Force Colonel Emmett. He didn't speak for long. This massive South African native liked to drink and eat, and his fingers resembled bunches of bananas. He said only a few words. We were at war, and he expected all officers and enlisted men to follow orders clearly from both base command and higher headquarters. He reported that we are to proceed according to a standardized plan. Expect two weeks of maximum stress, when we will have to fly as many sorties as possible, one week of constant pressure, and then a week of rest. He told us that the German Air Force was not in the best condition and appeared to have suffered serious losses in Poland. Then we went back to finish lunch. We waited all afternoon but no orders came in. That evening the pub was empty, everyone was writing letters home. The next day, it was just me and Rossi in the commander's office. I don't know where everyone else had gone, probably to play cricket. Suddenly Leonard Snaith walked in. He was quite a well-known squadron commander in the Royal Air Force. Before the war he had been one of the pilots of the Schneider Trophy races. Snaith was short and a sad expression never left his mustachioed face. He also played rugby for the Air Force and held the record in the quarter-mile run. He had a temper, however, and it was best not to get under his hot hand. Today, however, he was not interested in rugby. In a strange voice, he said, We have to go. Rossi and I remained silent. We have to pick up six airplanes, three each from the A and B links. I don't know the target, but I think we have to attack German ships, probably battleships. Each plane should carry four 500-pound bombs. The fuse delay is 11.5 seconds because we'll be attacking from low altitude. Air Captain Collier will lead the three of the B squadron. You two will fly with me. Take off at 3.30. When I saw him writing my name on the little piece of paper, I was overcome by an absolutely inexpressible feeling. A few days ago, I was sunbathing carefree, enjoying life, and the future seemed simple and clear. And now I'm a soldier, and I may very well not come back from my flight. Rossi felt the same way. Although he didn't say anything, his face visibly darkened. Soon everything was ready. The crew assembled, the bombs were hung on the plane, and we went to the briefing. However, to call it a briefing would not be serious. We gathered around a table, and the base commander told us what should be done. You are to attack the German pocket battleships that are stationed at the Schilling Raid at the entrance to the Kiel Canal. If for some reason there are no ships there, you are to bomb the ammunition depots at Marienhof. I must warn you at once, however, that if any civilian casualties are caused by the bombs, either in houses or docks, you will be punished in the strictest possible manner. The weather is expected to be bad. You must drop your bombs at low altitude. There are reports of barrage balloons, but you will not see them. They stay in the cloud layer. Don't stay over the target too long. Return if you decide that it is not possible to execute the attack as planned. After this wise counsel, Snaith briefly outlined his plan. We'll take off as a group, me as the right wingman, Rossi as the left wingman. When we approach the Von Scheer, we are to separate 500 yards apart and attack from three directions. Someone asked what would happen if the bombs bounced off the armored decks. The chief of ordnance replied, he stated that the bomb should hit the superstructure and it would explode when the airplane was already at a safe distance. Then Captain Pitt, who served as intelligence officer, took the floor. He reported that every ship of this type was armed with anti-aircraft machine guns and read a long paragraph from the flight manuals. It stated that one should attack from an altitude of 3,000 feet to avoid anti-aircraft fire. This was above the ceiling of the anti-aircraft machine guns, but below the minimum effective height of the heavy guns. He repeated again, 
that under no circumstances should we bomb Germany. Then someone else came up and started telling us how we should take off with bombs. None of us had ever done this before, and we simply had no idea how the Hampton would behave with 2,000 pounds of bombs on board. Advice is easier to give than to follow. He recommended using the trimmers more in flight. On the run-up, he should have taken the handle and given the fullest throttle possible. This all sounded pretty reasonable, as we had no idea about any of this. Today, Looking back, I realized with horror that we knew nothing at all. Only somehow we theorized that the Hamptons flew with a bomb load as well. There was nothing more to do in the headquarters, and we went to the restrooms, thinking over the finished plan. When we got off the bus, we got the commander's final advice. On no account were we to break away from the formation unless he himself ordered it. We were to fly together and act as a unit, not apart. The time was 2.30 p.m., when we were already getting into the trucks to go to the airplanes, a message came from the headquarters. The takeoff is delayed until 16.00. That was unnecessary. My guys were nervous enough as it was, and now they would rather be in the air than spend another hour waiting in suspense. We lay in the sun, smoking, but hardly talking. Everyone was trying to guess what had happened to delay the flight for an hour. In an air war, that's almost an eternity. At 15.30, there was a new message. The flight was postponed until 17.00. This time the messenger was escorted away with profanity. Everyone was nervous. My hands were starting to shake. We always wanted to run to the toilet. Some of us went there four times an hour. Finally, the order came to get into trucks and go to the airplanes. The pilots who stayed on the ground crowded around us. They just didn't know what should be said in cases like this. Eventually, they said goodbye to us, and someone uttered, Have a good trip. See you tonight. As I sat down in my pilot's seat, Tuffy, one of the mechanics, bent over to me and said in my ear, Good luck, sir. Give those bastards a real kick in the ass. I don't think I said anything in response, just smiled about the way one smiles when one doesn't hear too clearly what's being said. But Tuffy was one of the old-timers and realized exactly what had happened. Fastening my harness straps, he added, Now you don't have to worry. You'll be all right. You'll be back. And he was right. About five minutes later, we started the engines and began to taxi for takeoff, waiting for the guys from 49 Squadron, led by George Lerville, to take off. It was to George that the dubious laurels belong. His fifth group plane was the first to take off to strike Germany. We watched them take to the air, one by one. Some planes wiggled noticeably, but otherwise had no problems on takeoff. After that, Willie took off, then Rossi. In just a few minutes they disappeared in a cloud of propeller dust. But now I was completely calm and ready for anything. I gently pulled the brake handle pushing both throttle gears forward at the same time. Then I released the brakes and the old Hampton slowly lifted its tail. Thirty seconds later it was in the air, and we were headed for German territory. The airplane was too heavy. It took quite a while before we gained normal speed. It did not obey the rudders well and kept trying to stall on the wing. After a while I managed to get in line with Willy Snyder, and we set a course for Lincoln Cathedral. I could hardly hear Jack Warner saying, Okay, course 80 degrees magnetic compass, speed 160. But my thoughts were too far away. I was only watching the meadows drifting away under the wing. I could hardly believe that I had left England and was flying to Germany to drop bombs. It was just unbelievable. Many times we did training raids, but we always knew firmly that we would be back. We were sure there was a mug of beer waiting for us in the mess hall. That was not the case now. The fields were just beautiful. Sometimes you can even admire Lincoln County. I didn't want to leave it, all the while being drawn to turn back. I even wished something had broken at S. Charlie's so we could turn around legally. But we had no luck. The motor was hammering like a sewing machine, damn it. Then, far ahead, the coast showed up. Soon we were flying over a summer camp near Skegness. Only two months ago, I was here with the rest of the Link pilots, 
and we were all having a lot of fun. But soon the camp melted into the haze, and Germany was still two hours away. Time stretched slowly. We were flying at low altitude, only 1,000 feet. The waves below us looked much bleaker than before, but that was probably a joke of the imagination. Little Willie was looking straight ahead. I think he was concentrating all his attention on keeping on the right course. I myself was spinning my head like it was on a hinge. I had heard from one of the pilots who had been through the last war that it was the only way to survive. Perhaps Willie's excessive focus was the reason he didn't notice the German flying boat that flew 500 feet below us. It was a Doe 18. The German plane immediately turned left, and I could clearly see the white frightened faces of the German pilots looking at me through the cockpit glass. Perhaps they thought we were attacking them. I had such a thought, but in all the instructions written that the main task of the bomber, to attack the target and return back, not to chase the enemy aircraft. So we continued to fly our previous course. About 40 miles from Wilhelmshaven, the lower boundary of the cloud suddenly dropped to 300 feet. It began to rain. We closed formation. I opened the window so I could see Willie somehow and immediately got soaked. The sea below us was quite rough. Being about 10 miles from our target, we saw anti-aircraft shells bursting ahead. This meant that our first planes were already doing their thing. The clouds were now coming in at an altitude of only 100 feet. From my point of view, this was just fine for attacking ships, since in poor visibility we could make a surprise strike and immediately hide in the cloud from anti-aircraft fire. But to my amazement, the Snythe suddenly began to turn left. Completely unaware of what he was doing, I repeated the maneuver. I saw poor Rossi looking around in confusion, watching his wing. He thought the airplane might catch a wave at any moment. Then the leader straightened out, and I suddenly realized that he had turned back. Of course he was quite right. There was no doubt about it. All we knew was that we were heading roughly on course. But the bursts were equally likely to belong to Dutch guns or German guns from Helgeland. Snaith was not going to risk three airplanes to carry out an unsuccessful attack. The frustration was terrible, but discipline took over. We were ordered not to break formation, and orders must be obeyed. On the way back, we encountered the same flying boat again. I think it was on patrol to watch for airplanes approaching Germany. But we had already dropped our bombs into the sea and turned from bombers into fighters. I saw no reason that would prevent me from shooting the thing down. I radioed the commander and informed him of the contact. But there was no response, and we missed a great opportunity to shoot down the first enemy airplane of the war. We crossed the shoreline again already in the dark near Boston. All the beacons were out, and Navigator Willie was completely out of position. We hung around over Lincolnshire for nearly two hours before we managed to make up our minds. It wasn't until the moon rose that we spotted the canal leading to Lincoln itself and turned north towards the base. Finally, we did land. This was my first night landing on the Hampton, however it went safely. But what a disappointment that our flight ended in nothing. In spite of all the dangers to which we were exposed, it cannot be considered a raid. And yet we experienced all the proper sensations, if not worse. The first thing I saw as I entered the dining room were the surprised faces of the guys holding their mugs of beer. We thought you'd been hit. The Z Zebra's radio operator saw you going vertically down, straight into the sea. What happened? I told them I had absolutely no idea what they were talking about and went to bed. It's all just funny to remember now. We were yokel boys, with one exception. I was the kind of guy who never goes vertically down no matter whether it's into land or sea. That was the first raid. Yes, it was a failure. Yes, we didn't make the attack. But in those days we didn't know how to do it at all, and one can only wonder how we managed to get through the bad weather zone. And back. We saw enemy anti-aircraft shells bursting just on the horizon, but they were still firing at us. I thought then that if it kept looking the same, things would go pretty well. Although we failed, the second group Blenheims got their way and managed to damage the Von Scheer. They flew two hours ahead of us, 
and were able to spot the enemy. Attacking from low altitude, they put one bomb into the superstructure of the German ship, breaking the catapult and destroying the airplane standing on it. The next day, the newspapers were all about it. Much was said about the crew who had executed the successful attack, and Air Major Doran, now a prisoner of war, was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. The award was well deserved. In America and other neutral countries, this raid was good propaganda. It showed that things were not as grim as they seemed, and the old lion was still capable of striking serious blows. The Germans didn't waste any time in the propaganda war either. They declared that we had bombed civilians and that we would soon face severe retribution. Goring and Hitler were just fuming with anger. The fat Luft Marshal wanted to immediately send bombers to London, but Hitler held him back for the time being. Goebbels, that little stinker, had discovered a new way of waging psychological warfare. He got one of our downed pilots to participate in a broadcast on England, conducted by Lord Hao Hao. The conversation, as I recall, looked something like this. Question. Tell me, Sergeant, are you all right? Answer. Yes, I'm fine. Question. Are you being treated well? Pause. Then answer. Yes, everyone is very nice to me. Question. How do you eat? Long pause, then answer, wonderful, just like home. That's a bad show. I can see a gun to the poor guy's head. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The next day, I became the second military victim. I went to retrieve my parachute from the airplane. When I entered the mess hall, I saw a large black Labrador sitting in the hall. I love dogs, so I decided to walk up to him to pat him on the head and tell him how glad we were to see him in the mess hall. But the Labrador had an opinion of his own. His huge jaws clamped down on my arm, and I rushed to the washroom. Blood was pouring from my bitten hand, and a huge piece of my pants had been torn out. The pants were new, by the way. As the monster chased me, intent on biting me again, Pitcairn entered the pub, wearing heavy flight boots. Pete was a man of determination, and his swift kick threw the beast into the air. The dog scurried away. There were gaping holes in my unfortunate arm, and though I admitted it to no one, I was in great pain. We all wanted to execute the criminal without trial, but it turned out that he belonged to an aviation colonel, so he was pardoned. The colonel came to me when I was getting my fifth stitch. He was puffing heavily, for he had been torn from his luncheon. I hear you had a little trouble with Simba. That's a shame. You should keep an eye on him. Keep an eye on him. I could hardly contain myself. Poor old Simba later paid for his crimes in full. After two sure wins and four probable wins, he was put on a chain. Maybe his score increased today. Lieutenant Colonel Jordan took command of the squadron and granted me a 36-hour medical leave. Jordan was an excellent commander. In a matter of days he had gotten to know the entire squadron and gained general respect. Most of the time he was yelling. I recall one day when I arrived in his office and he was on two phones at once. To the group commander he was explaining that he had only 19 airplanes with a 19th inoperable. On the other phone he was talking to the kitchen, inquiring about the rotten potatoes served for lunch. While I wondered how he managed not to confuse the two phones, the adjutant hurriedly closed the door. Jordan was never afraid to make decisions, and this 36-hour leave of absence for me was something he'd just made up, since there was no statute for such an occasion. On September 5, my brother had a wedding I wanted to attend, so the vacation came in handy. The trip to Rugby turned out to be full of adventure. It was still very hot and blood was starting to seep through the bandage. As I stood on the platform at Nottingham waiting for a train, an old woman approached me. She said, Poor boy, bad luck. Over keel, I suppose. Then a young man came to me. My brother was there too. His name is Simpson. Wasn't he hit? Then an old man with a hat pulled over his eyes appeared. He looked around like a man about to tell a great secret and whispered, I was in the last batch, boy. I'm proud of you. I almost had a stroke. 
Why can't anyone walk calmly past a man with a bloody arm in a sling? Why does everyone assume I'm hurt? Because dogs bite sometimes. One of them bit me. They almost drove me crazy with their sympathy. I returned to Scampton with an aching arm and a heavy head. There were no people or airplanes on the airfield. Someone had heard that the Krats had destroyed dozens of airplanes on the ground in Poland. So phase no. Ten of the war plans had begun. All planes were put in the air and sent to Ringway near Manchester to avoid being hit by enemy bombers. I heard afterwards that the lads had had a good thrashing in Manchester, which is not surprising. So as soon as the doctor took the stitches out, I rushed over there too. When I got there, it was a cloudy day. I took a cab to the club. There Rossi told me the latest news. The guys were really doing well. Oscar had found a decent pod with beer, a gramophone, and pretty barmaids. One of the pilots even managed to propose to one of them after another round of drinks. The pub was located in a very good place, just halfway between Manchester and the airfield. So you could say you were heading for the city, but stop halfway, saving time and money, and indulge in more pleasant pursuits, such as drinking. For several days we lived in appalling conditions. Over forty people slept on mattresses right on the floor in a large hall. There were no wash basins and the pub had only one bath. But what was good about Ringway was that it was the assembly point for the women's auxiliary of the Air Force. These girls still wore dresses and were simply charming. They belonged to those who had enlisted at the very beginning of the war, when the prospects looked pretty grim, but their choice had not yet been forced. Work at Ringway was almost non-existent. Every day we gathered to check out the airplanes. It usually didn't take more than half an hour at most, and then we were free. Some would take a bath. Some would shave and clean themselves to get themselves in godly shape and ready to go to the pub for a five o'clock. The beer was consumed in huge quantities. Once news came that a German battleship had appeared in the Irish Sea, but it never happened again, and we spent our time quite serenely. Numerous parties were thrown. Needless to say, the numerous guys in blue flying uniforms attracted everyone's attention in the pub. It was a real vacation for us. The war had faded into the background, even though we had been fighting for a month. So why not get married while the sun shone? And there was plenty of sunshine in Manchester. The hospitality was amazing, with people trying to forestall our every wish. All doors were open, girls were kind, movie tickets were free and we lived like kings. And at the same time, some losers were conducting night raids on the Reich, but there were no bombs in their planes. They were either scouting or dropping leaflets telling the Germans to surrender or overthrow Hitler or both. Rumors reached Manchester about how the lads were doing it, though such flights are not something to brag about. Finally, it was Sunday when Oscar flew to Scampton for the sole purpose of washing clothes and finding money. I was simply shocked when one of the waitresses in the cafe at the airfield came up to me while I was following him. She said quietly, as if she was thinking the exact opposite. I hope he goes back. I agreed, though I was thinking of the five pounds he had promised me the next day. Gradually we got to know all the locals, and now time began to run short. Every evening, there was a cocktail party with the girls or something similar. We liked Manchester and it liked us. One day, while I was having coffee with Bruce Harrison in a little diner, a couple of girls from the women's auxiliary came over and sat down at our table. We spent that evening together. There was almost nothing to do, so we sat in the Midland Hotel until midnight, drinking cocktails and listening to the orchestra. Up to now I had not paid much attention to women. They seemed to me an indispensable part of parties, nothing more. Sometimes they were silly, sometimes they were smart, but none made much of an impression on me. I guess it was the war that affected me, but I quickly fell in love like a boy. From that moment on, I thought only of her all the time. She could fly, play golf and race cars. She was beautiful, she was wonderful, and all that. But although Barbara was very affectionate with me, one day she declared quite firmly that her heart belonged to a certain naval aviation pilot. So there you go. A little while later I saw him, but it struck me terribly. 
It took a war for the poor fellow to fall in love. One day, Sam Tripleton, deputy squadron commander, came to Ringway. He was supposed to pull us up. Command got wind that we were having too good a time, and they sent him over to see if we were. In the afternoon he kicked us out to a hotel where no liquor was served and vacated our pub. Naturally the faces of the pilots darkened, especially those who had managed to get girlfriends. This hotel was a few miles from the airfield. Despite the prohibition, it was there that I took part in the worst drunkenness of my life. And so the weeks passed. Rumors were already circulating that we were going to stay in Ringway forever. But someone in Bomber Command decided otherwise. Apparently, the Germans were too deeply entrenched in Poland to bomb England. But one day, as I sat in the recreation room, waiting for the fog to clear, my radio operator Max suddenly came running. Orders from group headquarters. Not immediately realizing what was the matter, we nevertheless headed for the radio room. To avoid long delays, as is usual than long-distance radiograms, we had set up a small radio to keep in constant communication with Scampton. This was strictly forbidden, but it proved very useful. When Mac finished writing down what he had heard, he handed the sheet to Rossi, who was the king of encryption. Deciphering a radiogram is a terribly tedious task, and we paced around impatiently, peering over his shoulder. He slowly wrote out the first sentence. The radiogram began in the standard way, from base to 83rd Division, Ringway. We've been waiting. Are we being sent to France? Are we being sent to Iceland? This is war. It's real. Maybe it's word from Oscar, who is going to come back at night, and he's asking us to find him a girlfriend. Then Rossi read the rest of it. Return to base. Begin preparations for night flying. When he finished reading, there was a general groan. Night flights. How awful. Leaflets. Great God. But Bruce was already thinking of the farewell party. Mull was thinking, too. I suppose he was supposed to meet the girl at the Café Royal. Silvo probably wasn't thinking about anything. I was thinking about Barbara and cursing. As we headed back to Scampton, I was way behind the other planes, as there was no way I could get my old S. Charlie to fly faster. I tried to show that we weren't so bad, but I picked the wrong time and place to do it. As I made a tight turn over the flight control tower, I saw a short figure on the pad waving his fists. I wasn't sure I recognized her, but a chill ran down my spine. I landed hastily and taxied to the farthest corner of the airfield, where I hoped no one would see me. When I arrived at the flight control center, it turned out that I was quite right. It was little Willie. He was back. I'd known for a long time that he had a soft spot for dudes, and I got the full brunt of it. I spent the next few nights in the radio center providing communications during night flights, but I was well rested during my stay in Ringway, so I took the punishment quite easily. Although the days stretched very slowly, September did end. The October fogs began to roll in. All night flights were canceled. Why? No one knew. Just canceled. That's all. Now we were preparing to attack enemy ships. Every day nine airplanes from each squadron had to be on duty in half-hour readiness. The duty started at 7 o'clock in the morning. All day long we sat in the recreation room, smoking, reading, listening to the radio. As soon as it started to get dark, we were dismissed. Not a fun life. It's real torture for a bomber pilot, and soon we were grumbling. The only bright spot was the furloughs. On the old Anson we could fly to Ringway for 24 hours to see old acquaintances, but that soon stopped as soon as the high command got wind of it. The October days crept by painfully slowly. It was beginning to seem to us that the whole war would turn into a tedious dragging gum. Events were crawling at a snail's pace. Ready. Stand down. Postponement. Boring. Gradually it began to dawn on us that all of last month's firesides were a waste of time and money. We weren't about to be sent to the front in France. We weren't threatened with death. This was some kind of static war. You will laugh. But I finally found time to visit the dentist. I had gotten the call in early September 
but somehow I hadn't gotten around to going to see him. When we ran into him in the dining room, I explained, I didn't come to see you because I didn't see the point of doing my teeth. It's a long and painful process, and I was sure I would be dead in just a few days. At the time I really thought so, and that was a perfectly typical sentiment in our squadron. Things were different now. It looked like the Germans were licking their wounds for the time being. But what they intend to do next was completely unclear, but it was quite clear what we would do. Nothing. Poland had fallen. Two huge armies stood against each other on the Maginot Line, exchanging all sorts of threats and insults through loudspeakers. The Germans urged the French to turn their arms against their British allies. And here is a story that shows that the Germans have a rather peculiar sense of humor. Once at the height of the fighting, the Mi-100, which was then considered the newest and most secret aircraft, made an emergency landing on the plane between the Maginot Line and the Siegfried Line. All day long the two adversaries kept a close eye on one another. The British and French prepared special patrols, which with the onset of darkness were to get close to the downed plane and try to pull it to the French trenches. Night came on. It was cloudy and quite dark. The patrol moved forward, crawling on all fours. The soldiers were afraid to breathe, lest they attract the attention of the Germans. Finally, they got close to the Messerschmitt. For a few minutes, they tried to catch their breath and then tied a rope around the tail of the plane. It was very difficult to work, as it was impossible to light even a match. After laboring for an hour, the Allies did their job and crawled back. Suddenly, two German searchlights came upon them. The bright light blinded the soldiers. They resembled thieves caught red-handed. One of the very same loudspeakers blared, If you want light, why the hell didn't you say so in the first place? For ten miles around, and then the Germans opened fire with machine guns. The next day, the French retaliated by shelling the German trenches with guns. The whole world watched these games and repeated, What a funny war! But the pilots were not laughing. We had been lucky so far, but one or two squadrons based at Hemswell had already suffered. We knew next to nothing about air warfare and had to learn by experience. Some were not so lucky. A squadron of twelve planes was sent to attack three German destroyers near Helgoland. Only six planes returned, and the pilots told a very strange story. It turned out that the destroyers did not have anti-aircraft machine guns, as had been assumed. Instead, they are installed a lot of small-caliber automatic cannons, which make the attack of a single plane from low altitude form suicide, unless it is not supported by other aircraft. It turned out that the destroyer had such maneuverability that it had no trouble dodging a single plane. It also turned out that it was possible to collide with German fighters even far from shore. Another squadron tried to attack enemy ships in Helgoland Bay. It split into links, but no German ships could be found. On the way home, apparently, they spotted German fighter planes. The link commander decided to get rid of the bombs to increase speed at least a little. The bomb hatch flaps opened. The pilots pressed the buttons. That was the last thing they did. The planes flew at an altitude of only 500 feet, and all were blown to pieces by the explosions of the bombs. There was no one and nothing left. There are still all sorts of stories about this episode, both from us and from the Germans. This is a new war, and we had to learn from our own bitter experience. The raid on Wilhelm Shaven Wellingtons, without fighter cover, was another example of familiarity with the unknown but I cannot indiscriminately blame the headquarters. At the time, everyone thought that a close formation of Wellingtons could defend against Mi-109 attacks. However, we learned such a lesson that such raids were never repeated. Why? Because it cost too much for the pilots. At the same time, this operation completely destroyed our confidence in German military reports. They said that they shot down 54 aircraft, which exceeded the number of Wellingtons involved in the operation. But the Germans weren't sitting idle either. They targeted Scapa Flow. The raid was unsuccessful because the bombing was too inaccurate. Our fighters claimed to have shot only one rabbit, and I'm inclined to believe them. 
But later a German submarine stealthily sneaked through the booms into this naval base, sank the battleship Royal Oak, and slipped back out. This proves some unreliability of our booms. They should be strengthened, said an admiralty spokesman. A few days later, the Krat pilots made a new raid. Over the fog-covered waters of the Bay Firth of Forth appeared twelve German planes that tried to attack the ships standing in the harbor of Edinburgh. Our fighters, first gladiators and then spitfires, were put on alert and several Heinkels did not return. It should be noted that these raids involved some of the best German pilots who had worked for Lufthansa before the war. I heard an almost unbelievable story about one warlike reserve major. He had already shot down one Heinkel and then chased down another. He chased the German over Drem and the green fields of Berwick. That's where the German plane went down. Admiring this sight, our hero suddenly decided to become the first fighter pilot to capture the crew of the downed plane. The Major quickly drew up a plan of action. He made a couple of circles over the field, but the only ones who saw him were all the same Germans who sat next to the crashed Heinkel and curiously watched their enemy. Our hero released the flaps and sat down without turning off the engine. But then the wheels of the Spitfire bogged down in the mud, and the plane scapatized. The pilot tried to get out of the cockpit, in vain. He was trapped and hung upside down, listening to the unpleasant sound of dripping gasoline. The only thing left to do was to wait for someone to help. The Germans, who had been watching all this with considerable amazement, finally decided to do something. They ran up to the Spitfire and in a matter of seconds freed the pilot. Jumping out from under the wreckage, our hero immediately grabbed his gun and said, You're under arrest. Does anyone speak English? The German captain replied, displaying a perfect Oxford pronunciation. I speak. I graduated from Malvern and Trinity. But Major... That was one hell of a bad landing. These are the kind of stories that began to emerge over time. Whether they were true or not is unknown. However, any one of them had some basis in fact, and for many more months similar tales were told in all the pubs of Lincoln. I should note here that at that time the enlisted men could not yet perform as well as the enlisted pilots. About a year later they had settled in and performed to the best of their ability. But in the harsh days of 1939, they could not yet be relied upon. However, about this a little later. In November the rains came. Our squadron began to receive replenishment. Flashed new people who arrived from training units. One day we were sitting in the flight control center when five new recruits arrived at once. Jackie Withers, Tony Mills, Bill Twiddell, Dickie Bunker, and Grinny Greenwell. They were all English except for Grinny, who was born in South Africa. They were visibly nervous as they had absolutely no idea what was in store for them. They were all quite young, except for Jackie Withers. Oscar looked around at the newcomers. I suppose they didn't expect to see such a young Link commander and certainly didn't expect his uniform to be open, his cap knocked back on the back of his head and his feet flaunting on the table. He said, Boys, you are all very lucky because you fell into my link. All provocateurs go to the B link. The only thing required of you is to show performance and high flying discipline. You've probably been taught to fly Hamptons and you probably think you're ace, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to disappoint you. You're all going to be co-pilots. That means you'll have to learn to navigate. And it also means that you'll only be allowed to fly the airplane on a night training flight. He quickly assigned the new recruits. Tony Mills went to Jack Kinnock. Greeny went to Ian. Then Oscar smiled wryly and looked at me. And now you, Jibbo, since you have the crappiest radio operator and the worst airplane, and since you're still a lardus yourself, you get this one. He pointed to Jackie Withers. I knew Oscar was joking, but Jackie didn't realize it. Well, thanks, Oscar, I said, and turned to Jackie. You're a damn lucky man. You got the best pilot in the squadron. I made it out of the room in time to be escorted out of the room by shouts of, You're a dickhead. Watch out, he'll kill you. I had already slammed the door shut when a flight boot slammed into it. After that, I stared at Jackie. 
He was a curious sort. His mother was an opera singer, and he was trained as a ballet dancer. Jackie was also good at playing any jazz tunes on the piano. He could even sing, like Harry Roy. But the most important thing about Jack was that he had a heart of gold and was not afraid of anyone or anything. A little later I discovered that he was a good flyer too. At the end of November, we were all startled by the news that three German destroyers had been sighted just two miles from Newcastle. We were sent out on a reconnaissance mission. If the report was true and the destroyers were really there, both squadrons were to take off immediately and attack them with bombs. Needless to say, it all turned out to be phony. We were on our way back to base when a new message arrived. We were ordered to search the North Sea 20 miles off the Danish island of Silt. Jackie clutched his head. I didn't bring the right charts. We didn't need them, though. We just followed Oscar the whole time and saw nothing but a fishing boat. When we flew up to Zilt, all we saw was a layer of clouds over the land. When we flew back, we crushed a few cans of beer for joy. In our group, we were the first pilots to see German territory during the day. A dubious pleasure, to say the least. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. About this time, the German pocket battleship Deutschland attempted to break into the Atlantic. The one type Graf Spee had already been dealt with. And now the Air Force Command decided to give the bombers an opportunity to demonstrate their art. One day came the message that Deutschland left Kiel and headed for the North Atlantic to attack our shipping. A scout plane reported that it was traveling northward along the coast of Norway and was now near Stavanger. At dawn a commotion broke out at Scampton. All the crews were called at once, although there were only nine airplanes left in each squadron. The briefing didn't take long. The attack should be carried out in lengths of three airplanes each. The total number of aircraft involved in the operation, about 50. In the event of enemy fighters should close formation and cover each other as far as possible. At the last moment, my place was taken by Joe Collier and left me on the ground burning with anger. But within hours he regretted his insistence. So they took off. Commanded the strike group Lieutenant Colonel Sheen, commander of the 49th Squadron. In one of the planes was an observer who had to binoculars to identify Deutschland. Upon seeing the pocket battleship, he was to fire a colored rocket. After that, our pilots had to boldly attack the said ship, without fear that it is a randomly turned out British cruiser. The planes flew over the windswept North Sea, keeping an altitude of 10,000 feet, and finally spotted the coast of Norway. It took them only two hours to get there, as they were driven by a strong tailwind. However, Sheen, who was piloting the lead plane, bravely decided to fly farther than the plan called for. Keeping three miles off the coast in a zone of wonderful weather, they flew north, looking at all the cubs and fjords, until they arrived at the point from which they had to turn back. They were running out of gasoline. The planes turned westward, toward England. But now, there was a headwind, and it quickly turned into a real storm. Our Hampton had not too high speed, and if you look at the sea, you could see that relative to the surface, they barely moved at all. After four hours, the very observer suggested that they had passed north of Scotland and were now in the Atlantic. So he advised turning southeast, and so they did. At that time, radio communication between the planes was not very reliable. After a while, the chief navigator on board the lead plane managed to convince the observer that he was mistaken, and the planes turned west again. But now gasoline supplies were rapidly dwindling. The planes had been in the air for ten hours, and the pilots anxiously watched the fuel gauges. The hands hovered around the 100-gallon mark, and there was no sign of land. It was beginning to look like the whole group was going to have to land on water. Suddenly, a small fishing boat emerged from the fog ahead. The day was drawing towards evening. It was already quite dark and the old fisherman steering the boat had obviously finished his work and was on his way home. He was greatly surprised when suddenly fifty Hamptons began circling his boat, transmitting secret call signs with their searchlights. However, the fisherman had no radio or signal lights, 
so he simply waved at the planes, assuming the pilots were fooling around. Meanwhile, one of the squadrons, which was commanded by Willie Watt, describing another circle, accidentally spotted land on the horizon and immediately turned there. Fifteen minutes later it landed safely in Montrose. She was followed by the rest of the squadron, which also managed to land. The bomber, which was piloted by one surgeon, was already coming in for a landing when it ran out of gasoline, and one engine quit. The pilot gave full throttle to the second engine, but after a few seconds that one also stalled. The airplane crashed in a cemetery near the airfield, but the crew was unharmed. On December 1, nothing happened. We only received a message that Russia had invaded Finland. Why it happened will be found out only after the war, but I believe the Russians. If they did so, they had good reasons, although we didn't think about it at the time. It was on December 1 that I got a three-day leave, the first since I had been bitten by a dog. We weren't allowed to go too far away. We always had to be able to get back to the unit in 12 hours. So I went to Coventry to stay with my brother. The vacation went quietly, including the usual amount of beer drinking and a game of rugby. But at one of the parties I met Eva Moore, and at the same moment I fell madly in love with her. She was short and very pretty, and she knew how to keep a conversation going. During the boring parties where war reports were chewed over, it was nice to meet someone to talk to about books and music. Most people who can talk about these things aren't very likable, but this girl was very attractive. Her parents worked in Cardiff. I was still licking the heartbreak Barbara had caused me, and most of the guys in my squadron already had steady girlfriends, so I didn't see any reason why I couldn't find a girlfriend. Eve suited me. It was very nice to live like a normal person, walking around with a beautiful girl, but it soon came to an end. The last night we were at a cocktail party at the King Head Hotel. The fun dragged on until 3 a.m. It was the most casual drinking. The only thing I remember was having the folly of mixing rum with whiskey. A foodie can only cringe when he hears about that. After saying goodbye to my brother and the rest of the company, I made my way to the car and headed for Scampton, which was about 100 miles away. No one can feel normal at 3 a.m., and rum and whiskey do not make one feel better. At times my eyes were blurry. The headlights had camouflage visors, and as a result the headlights did not shine at all. After an hour I lost the road and almost hit a ditch. Then I decided to sleep to wait for dawn. An hour or two later I woke up with a buzzing head and a nasty taste in my mouth. As they say, the rum went backwards. As soon as I got to Scampton, I rushed to the hangar and passed out in the pilot's lounge. I was a few hours late, but I didn't want Willie to catch me with horrible alcohol breath. The room was quiet and warm, and I got a great night's sleep. As I was dozing off, a few guys showed up. Through my sleep I heard someone say, Oh, Gibbo's back. Then someone else added, Look at those bags under his eyes. He had a lot of fun. Everyone laughed, and it was too much. With one leap I got to my feet and yelled at the couple eyeing me. Get out of here, you damn devils. I drove a hundred miles despite a terrible hangover. And now I'm asleep. They immediately fled, for they had a perfect idea of my condition. The weather in December was for the most part terrible. Although we spent our time on constant alert, waiting for the order to take off, only two times did we actually get in the air to intercept the elusive Deutschland. But both times the order to return came just an hour later, and it appeared that we were getting our pay for nothing. Every day the airfield was covered with fog, although we could see a small farm at the other end of the airfield. And then some boss in the air ministry decided that the Scampton airfield was too small. This farm was in the way of lengthening it, so it was decided to demolish it. One of the squadron commanders, Johnny Cheek, suddenly had a bright idea. If the farmhouse is doomed, why not destroy it with 500-pound bombs? We would get some practice in bombing from low altitudes and at the same time find out how our bombs behaved in this case. At once a competition between squadrons was announced and all began to look forward to the big day. 
At last, the opportunity arose. But at the very last moment, the ministry intervened and authorized the use of only training bombs. But they had to release a column of smoke when they fell for realism. The boys took off one by one. They dropped the bombs from a height of 100 feet. Although the pilots tried their best, the result was not good. Some just missed. Others had their bombs ricocheted off the ground, fly over a building, and explode a quarter mile from the target. We learned a lot that day. It turned out that strafing was a lot harder than we thought. It turned out that ricocheting bombs could fly a long distance if the fuse was mounted in the tail section. Someone made a suggestion to attach pins to the bombs so they would stick into the ground like darts. The winner of the competition was Johnny Cheek, who managed to put a bomb right through a bedroom window. It was quite funny because he always lost at darts. That's how December went. Once or twice we had competitions. We practiced landing and bombing. In this way we tried to keep ourselves busy, but on the whole we were languishing in idleness. We were beginning to think there was some kind of strange war going on. One day I flew with Oscar to Street Athen in South Wales to pick up some secret equipment for our Hamptons. The flight was difficult as we were accompanied by low clouds the whole way. When we popped out of the clouds over the Bristol Channel, at an altitude of 500 feet, the ships of some convoy immediately opened fire on us and nearly shot us both down. We were saved only by the poor marksmanship of the gunners, and at the airfield we were stranded. The weather became even worse, and we decided to spend the night here to fly the next day. This suited me fine, because I was able to visit Eva's house and meet her parents. Then we left Cardiff. And then Christmas came up, our first military Christmas. From the morning, we were in readiness to fly out to attack enemy merchant ships. When it was time for lunch, we took oranges and other delicacies out of our in-flight-only rations and we thought of the lucky ones who could have a good drink and a good time. But someone upstairs heard our prayers, and the flight was cancelled. The party did happen. First we went to the mess hall of the enlisted personnel, which was covered with a shroud of tobacco smoke. The party began with loud yelling. Each squadron tried to outshot their neighbors. First, the 49th took over, then the 83rd, then the 49th again, and it ended in a hellish cacophony. We remembered an old Royal Air Force tradition. On Christmas Day, the officers served the privates, and the privates were allowed to call the officers by whatever name they wanted. So we had to listen to a lot of unpleasantness. One mug of beer followed another, and faster and faster. The party got rougher and rougher, and the language got harsher and harsher. But here another tradition came in handy, that officers must leave the party when chairs start flying through the air, or they will be in trouble. Then we went to the surgeon's mess hall, where any of the surgeons had the right to splash gin into an officer's beer mug. I was spiked several times, and I just don't remember how I got home. No one was ever punished for it. Christmas. No one knows if we'll get to celebrate another one. After making sure the privates and NCOs had a good time and filled up on beer to the brim, we went to the officers' mess hall for our own celebration. It was a nightmare. The party turned into a stag party, as there were no girls at the party. But what a stag party it turned out to be. First each squadron sat down separately, then someone shouted, Boys, come here. To hell with the ceremonies. I still remember being pulled out from under a pile of bodies to be taken to the telephone. It was Eva calling to wish me a Merry Christmas. Then I headed back to that dump. It's just a miracle, no one was hurt. Finally, I thought it would be a good idea to go to bed. I kicked myself hard and found it very difficult to walk straight. As I made my way down the hallway, I came across four fire extinguishers. I didn't notice them, partly because the hallway was dark partly because. I don't know why. Anyway, I hid all four of them in turn, and they all went off. I just didn't know what to do. First, I tried putting them on so that the foam would stop flooding the hallway. That didn't work. They would shut up for a second, and then start pouring down my pants again. It was impossible to control them, so I threw them out the window. What a racket! 
Glasses clinking, fire extinguishers gurgling. I got to bed feeling good that I'd done my best to get out of a bad situation. But the next day, the dining room clerk coldly informed me that I was to be deprived of liquor for a month in view of the havoc I had wreaked in the dining room. I was terribly angry and rushed out to find Willie Snythe. He found a way to comfort me, however. Think about it, Gibbo. Everything that's done is done for the best. You'll save a lot of money, and you can spend it on gifts for your girlfriend. That sounded reasonable, and for a month I didn't touch alcohol. 1939 was over. It ended in a wrong way. A drunkenness, not a combat flight. But if we had known what awaited us in the next three years, the drunkenness would have been even more grandiose.